I'm just going to steal sharing privileges from you if that's all right. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, I'm assuming everyone can see my screen. If that is not the case, please let me know. Um, all right, cool. So, um, uh, hi, my name is my name is Michi DeWitt. I, I introduced myself earlier. I'm one of the co-directors for Women Who Code San Diego, and also uh, one of the co-organizers of Angular San Diego, uh, San Diego JS. Um, and I also do some blogging for the ng-conf blog. Um, so this talk I'm doing today is actually uh, I also have a blog post on it that that you can read afterwards um, if you feel so inclined. Um, so tonight our topic is going to be Angular structural directives. Uh, this talk is going to be, um, I think, really useful for, for beginner Angular developers. We're going to kind of just go into the basics of two of the most commonly used Angular structural directives, um, ng-if and ng-4. But we're also going to talk about some of the more advanced features um, in structural directives that you might not know about. So I'm hoping that regardless of your skill level, um, you might be, you'll be able to get something out of this talk. Um, so let's dive in. Uh, all right, so first, what are directives? Um, directives are one of the main building blocks of Angular, uh, some of the other building blocks being things like services and pipes and modules um, and components in a sense, but those are really just directives. Um, they're used to, uh, directives are used to change the appearance or behavior um, of the DOM. And there are three different types of directives in Angular. The first type uh, is the one that most people are, are probably the most familiar with, whether you realize it's a directive or not, and that's the component. Um, components are just directives that have a template. Um, the, the second is an attribute directive. These are used to change the appearance or behavior of the DOM. And then the third, which is the topic of our um, conversation tonight, are structural directives. Um, and those are used to change like the, the structure of the, the layout. Um, yeah, so, um, so what are structural directives? Um, as I just said, they're, uh, they, they, you should change the structure of the layout. So what does that mean? Um, you can change the structure of your layout by either adding elements, uh, removing elements, um, or, or even changing elements. And when I say element, I mean like an, an HTML element. The structural directives are always going to be, or they should always be prefixed with an asterisk um, so that you can really easily identify them. Um, I believe there's something in Angular that is going to enforce that, but all the built-in Angular ones are prefixed with an asterisk. And it is the, the best practice that if you create a custom structural directive in your code base, that you also prefix yours with an asterisk. Um, and most directives work by uh, manipulating the structure um, based on values that are in the component. So like you'll maybe use flags that you have in your component or arrays of data. Um, and the those values are used directly to manipulate the DOM. That means that structural directives are really useful for dynamic applications um, because you can really easy, easily change your DOM um, with, with that data in the component. Um, so how do you use structural directives? Um, it's very simple. You're going to use them just like you would any other directive. And you, and you just simply have to add the structural directive as an attribute on any element in your Angular template. Um, so in this example, we have a, it's an example directive called sum directive. We can see um, it clearly because it has that asterisk on it. So right away, we know that it's a structural directive. Um, and it's being added to this div element. So whatever this, this fake sum directive does, uh, it would change the structure of the div element directly. Um, also, you can bind properties to your directives, just like you could bind properties uh, to a custom component that you're writing, or it, like you can bind properties to a attribute directive. Um, so in this example, we have, again, just a fake directive called some other directive. We clearly know it's a structural directive because of the star. Um, and then we're binding it to some property in our component called, called some property. Um, so these are just kind of like the basics of, of how you would be using a directive in your template. Well, this is all pretty vague, so let's start looking at something more specific. Um, so first, we're going to talk about ng-if. Um, the ng-if directive uh, is used to, um, to conditionally add or remove elements. Um, and really, all that means is when you add an ng-if directive to an element, um, it will uh, 
you bind it to a condition and then whatever the value of that condition is, is going to drive whether that element that you add the NGF to is going to be added to your DOM or if it's going to be removed to your, from your DOM or potentially not added at all. Um, if anyone's used AngularJS before, this should look really familiar to you because it's almost identical to the, to the NGF directive that we had in AngularJS. Um, so let's walk through the, the initialization process real quick. So when you uh, add a component and the component gets initialized, um, any NGF that you have in your component that's going to be on some sort of element, um, in this case, it's a div, um, the, the value of that condition is going to be checked. And if that condition evaluates to truthy, then whatever this element is, in this case, again, the div, will, that element will be added to your DOM. So you'll see that on the page, it will show up. If that condition evaluates to falsy, then that element is just not going to be added at all. It's just going to get skipped, and then we're going to, you know, you're going to keep going through the rest of the template. Um, so it might sound a little uh, fancy, but it's really just a simple um, add or remove. Then, as you know, the throughout the lifecycle of your component, if anything changes in your data that affects the value of that condition, um, the uh, that binding will get checked again, and then we. Um, that element will be appropriately added or removed. So let's say that during initialization, some condition here evaluated to truthy, and then something changes in the application or in the component that now some condition evaluates to falsy, this div is going to be completely removed from the DOM. Um, and then vice versa, if it hadn't been added in the first place, but now some condition is um, becomes truthy later, this element is going to be added back into the DOM. So you, you're start, you can start to see how this is, can be really helpful with dynamic applications when you want um, when the page isn't static and you want to be adding and removing um, maybe like cards or tables, charts from your page. Um, also, the NGF directive should look really uh, familiar for anyone that knows JavaScript or most programming languages because the syntax and the, the behavior is very similar to a conditional if statement. You know, we just have if some condition, that condition is checked. If that condition is true in JavaScript, you execute the code in those curly brackets. For the ng if, it's pretty much the same thing. We check this condition. If that condition is true, then um, the entire element is going to be added um, to, to the DOM. And if it's false, you're just going to skip it. Um, so I think this is a really smart. Um, syntax for the Angular team to use, because this does make it pretty easy and intuitive for developers to start picking up, um, because it has that syntax that's familiar to things that you've hopefully seen before. Um, and I, I've mentioned a couple times that that element gets added or removed, but I do want to just uh, highlight this part again, because having the element get added or removed is so much more powerful than doing like a show or hide. Because when you just show or hide an element, like you could do that with maybe just CSS, um, like just like setting visibility in, or display none, um, that, that element is still in your DOM, right? It was still initialized, it's still taking up memory. Um, and this doesn't matter too much if it's something really simple like a text element, like a string, right? But imagine if you have the NGF on something like a table, and when that table initializes, it grabs a bunch of data from the server, it processes the data as data to the table, but you don't need to show that table anyway. You're doing all this processing, you're holding all this, this data in memory for no reason. Um, so using something like an NGF to make it so those elements are only added when you need them, and then also those elements can be removed when you no longer need them, mean that you get to, to um, have a lot more control um, over those those expensive components in your application. Um, looks like we have a couple chats. I'm just going to check that real quick. Um, null would uh, would be falsy. Um, yeah, that, that's a good fact flag. Um, whatever that condition is, it doesn't have to evaluate directly to true or false. It's going to evaluate to truthy or falsy. Um, so things that would be false would be like um, you know null undefined. Um, uh, zero, like things like that. Um, but always, you know, if you're if you're ever unsure, you know, always better to make sure that it's, it's binding directly to something that evaluates to to a uh, boolean. Um, and I didn't I didn't highlight this part, but you can. Oh, um, this condition you can bind it directly to a property. So like in this case, maybe some condition is something uh, like it just binds to a boolean flag, but can also bind to an object. So you can be like, all right, you know, is 
is some condition, like is some object defined? If it's defined, then I want to go in that, um, I want to add this element. Or this could be an expression because this is Angular. So you could have something like, um, you know, if some property dot type equals table, then add this, you know? So you, you have a lot of control um, over, over what that expression is um, because it's an Angular template. Um, all right. Um, all right, so we've kind of covered this already, but let's talk about some optimal use cases for RenGIF. Um, if you want to uh, show, uh, sorry, if you want to add or remove content based on the action of a user, NGF is a great um, tool for that. Um, so imagine we kind of talk about this table example. I have a table, maybe the user has like a show hide button. Um, you can make it so that clicking on that button updates a, a Boolean flag that's true or false. And then you could bind that Boolean flag to an NGF directive that will add or remove that table based on the value of that button or you know, based on the, the action from the user. Um, you also might wanna add or remove content based on configuration. Uh, for example, the application that I work on, it's a, we have these configurable dashboards. So users can add things like, like text and charts and tables um, and anything they add gets saved in their configuration. So the next time they log on, we load their configuration that they had last time and they can see the, their dashboard um, just as it was last time they logged on. And the way we do that is using things um, like ngif and ng4 that you'll see later to check the value of configuration that we've loaded and then add content based on that value. Um, and then another, another good use case is adding or removing content based on uh, specific values in your component. So one thing I do a lot is sometimes I'll have error messages in my components. So it may be something like, um, you know, if, if you enter invalid data, or maybe um, if we're filling out a form and, you know, you, you miss something or, or again, there's, there's an error in your form, you don't want to show those error messages all the time. You only want to show them when there's actually an error to show. So using ngif on that error message and binding it to something like a has error flag is a really great way to add and remove that content um, based on the, the values in your component. Um, yeah, and share, share point out in the chat that you can use the, the question mark for the, the, or the Elvis operator uh, for ngifs too. Um, and that's absolutely correct. Um, in, in Angular templates, you can, you know, you can use uh, things like the Elvis operator um, to uh, just you know bring more power to your templates. Um, all right, so those are the basics of of NGF. Um, like I said, you, you're uh, <laughs> uh, you're just going to bind it directly, you know, to to some sort of expression or condition, and then you're going to add or remove content based on that uh, that expression. So now let's get into some of the um, extra features that are built into NGF that maybe you don't know about today. So the first one is going to be the else syntax. So uh, similar to when you're writing code, you might have situations where if that condition evaluates to truthy, you want to show whatever that, that template is or that element that NGF is added to. But if it's falsely, you might want to show something else. Um, so in that case, you might be tempted to add a second NGF um, like this that's going to explicitly check that condition again. So in this case, I have my first div says ng if uh, some condition, and then if some condition is true, they show this. And then, um, so that's the first one. And then we have a, we have a second ng if that is the exact same condition that we had above, just with a, a, a not a, a bang in front of it. Because we want to say, you know, if that's not true, then show this other div. This technically works. So I have seen some weird edge cases around it, but this is not the recommended use case. Um, instead, we can use the else syntax to, um, to make it so we only have that one single condition and we make our code a lot more readable. So let's dive into why is this better. Um, first, this is clean and it's easier to understand, right? We have all of our, con our logic in one spot in that ng if where it says ng if some condition. Um, we don't have that, that condition duplicated. so. We don't have to worry about if we need to update that condition, having to update it in two places. It's all there in one spot. And then also, this is a bit more readable. I can look at this and say, all right, if some condition is true, I know what I'm doing. And I can clearly see that if some condition is falsy, that 
there's something else on this page that we're going to show. Um, in that anti-pattern we had here, it's not clear from just looking at this first div that there's something else that we would want to show if that if that first condition is falsy, right? You only know by looking throughout the rest of your code. But in this one, I know right away that, hey, if this is falsy, there's something else that we're going to show in our DOM. Um, the other nice thing is that we have uh, the ng template is how, is how we reference it. And we can put that anywhere in our HTML. So we can put that right below if that makes sense. Or if maybe if this other block is something really complicated and long, we can put it at the end of our HTML template. Um, and that's really based on what you and your team, um, what your best practices are. Um, but the, the key thing to note here is that this div where we have the ng if some condition, uh, if we go into the else statement, exactly where this div is in your template is where the, the other block is going to be put. Um, so it's just gonna be, it's just gonna replace that with that first block. Um, and again, this should feel uh, pretty familiar to developers because it mirrors the if else syntax in JavaScript. So, you know, in JavaScript, we'll have if some condition, you know, we'll execute the first block of code. And if that's false, then that first block of code will be completely skipped and we'll execute this other block of code. Again, very similar here. If this first condition is truthy, we add this. If it's not truthy, then we'll add this block. Um, so again, a really, uh, really smart syntax um, and API decision on the Angular team, uh, Angular team's part to, to use these syntaxes that, that mirror other syntaxes that we use. I'm just checking the chat again. <laughs> Talking about Elvis, all right, that works. Um, all right, the the second advanced feature of NGFs that we're going to talk about is storing the value. Um, so a, another uh, common use case is that whatever that value of that NGF condition is, and remember, it could be um, something like you know value equals you know some string, or it can be you can bind it to an observable using the async pipe. Um, it, it's not always necessarily just like a simple property. It could be a, a complicated expression. Um, you might need to reuse the result of that condition other places in your template. Um, I think the most common use case for this is when you're binding a data that, that is observable with the async pipe, because you want to normally use the data that comes out of that async pipe. And you'll use ngf to see if once, you know, if, if data has been emitted. So in that case, um, Another thing that might be the first knee-jerk knee reaction to do is to just add that, um, that conditional logic elsewhere. So that's what we have in this, this anti-pattern where we have our first NGF, we're binding to a, an observable called table data. Uh, we're getting the data out of that observable using the async pipe. Um, and in this case, we have that, that table example I referenced earlier, where if we have data for the table, we wanna show the table. And if we don't have data, maybe there was an error in the data, um, who knows? We don't want to add this table at all. Maybe like adding my table component is you know really expensive. Um, so I have this first NGF that says if you know if data exists in my table, and then later I need to actually use that data and bind it to my table component. Um, so I end up repeating that logic again. I have table data pipe async in two places. Um, again, the Angular team has thought of a better way for us to do this, and that's using the as syntax. So in this case, all I have to do is take that first NGF I had before, um, which is table data pipe async, and then use this as data syntax, which was going to bind the data from uh, that's emitted from the observable into this property that I've called data. Um, and then I can reuse that variable um, in elsewhere in my component um, to bind it to, to this my table component. Um, so again, uh, why is this better? Um, the first two reasons are the same as before. It's a, it makes the template really clean, makes the logical flow a lot easier to understand. Um, and it keeps your conditional logic all in one place. And then also in the case of observables, we only have one subscription for that observable. We don't need to create additional subscriptions, um, that are unnecessary when we have the data from that first sub subscription, um, in the, in the first line. Um, so to summarize NGF, uh, it's a structural directive that allows you to control the DOM uh, by adding or moving elements uh, based on a conditional value. 
uh, you can use the else syntax and the as syntax to take full advantage of all the features provided by the Angular team and really take your use case or your use of the NGF to uh, you know, the next level. Um, before I move on, are there any questions about NGF specifically? Um, oh, Lonnie is asking, is it outside of the block or just within nested? I'm guessing what you're talking about here is the use of this data variable. Um, that's a really great question. Um, and in that case, you have to use it in the um, uh, nested. You can't use it outside of the block. Um, did that answer your question? Awesome. Um, any other questions about NGF before I move on? Cool. All right. So the next structural directive we're going to talk about today is NG4. Let's dive in. Um, so the NG4 directive is used to iterate over a collection of objects and add in an instance of a specified template for each item in the collection. That sounds kind of complicated, but really all we're saying is I have an array of items and I want to add the same element for each item in the array. Um, so something like a, a list of, of items, like a to-do list is a really great use case for this. Um, we're going to have a slightly more in-depth example in a minute uh, of that. Um, or we're going to have that right now. Uh, so in this case, uh, I have a to-do list. We're not using ng4. Um, I have it, it's called my to-do list. I have my to-do item, and I have it repeated three times, right? Um, so I have to walk the dog. I have to go to the gym. I have to write a blog post. Um, this is not great because we have this same code, you know, repeated multiple times, right? This is really just the same. The only thing that's different is the title and the description. Um, that means that if I want to, you know, add something like an event listener or an extra property on my to-do item, I'm going to have to add it in three places. And this is really static, right? I can't add extra to-do items without changing my code and deploying new code. This also would be really hard for users to use because users don't really write code, so they wouldn't be able to add anything to their to-do item. So all they would ever see is mine, and that's not helpful. So enter ng4. With ng4, we took that exact a block of code that we had before. So this block is like 15 lines long. And now it's in a nice, concise six line block of code. So what are we doing here? So we're taking um, something called to-do items. So in this case, just pretend that that's, uh, that's an array of uh, to-do item objects that's in my component. We're going to iterate over each one of them. Um, and for each instance, we'll store it in a variable called item. And then we're using that item property, or the item variable um, to retrieve data from that to-do item and bind it to uh, my specific my to-do item component. So in this case, you can imagine that the array of to-do items has something with item.title equals you know, gym, item.title equals walk the dog, item.title equals blog post um, to mirror the data that we had here. And same thing with the descriptions. So now all my data is really concise. It's in one spot. Um, so So again, let's talk about a little bit about why this is better. Um, first, it's dry. So we talked before about how we had my to-do item over and over. So we had we were repeating ourselves a lot. Um, we're not repeating ourselves anymore. Uh, this is dynamic now. I could get to-do items from um, a server. I could add to-do items um, using like an add button in my component. Uh, I could have to-do items that are specific to each user. And no matter what it is, my uh, the UI in my application is going to show all the items that are in my array. Um, and it's extendable. It's going to be a lot easier now to do something like add another property, like is done, or maybe add an event listener um, on the my to do item. So I only have to add it in one spot. And it's going to be applied to all of my to do item components, whereas before I would have had to add it to all three of those items and any other items I want to add. Um, and again, very similar to the NGF. This has some similarities to JavaScript. Um, it's using the exact same syntax as the, the for of loop in JavaScript. Um, you can see in JavaScript, we have for let item of to do items. Notice this is the exact same syntax that we had in our template. Um, and then in JavaScript, we would do something with each one of those items, right? In this case, I'm just simply logging, uh, console logging the title and description, but we'd probably do something more exciting. Um, but this is the, you know, really maps one-to-one -one with what we're doing here. We have let item of 
to do items. And then we're doing something with each one of those items. So again, this should feel pretty familiar to developers. It reduces the mental overhead of, of trying having to learn new syntax because hopefully it's syntax that you already know. Um, and it should make it fairly easy and intuitive to start using. Um, so that's the basics of ng4. Let's get into some more advanced properties uh, like we did with ngif. The first thing is variables. Sometimes you'll need to know additional information about the object's position in the array. So some common use cases for that are maybe you have a table and you want to add a CSS class for every other element in that table. Um, so I want to know like, you know, is, um, is this row an even row or an odd row and do something based on it. You might want to know what the index, the exact index of the object is in the array. So if you're doing something like deleting an item, which I'll have an example for in a moment, um, you'll know exactly which index to remove from the array. Um, or you might want to know if the item is the first or last item in the array. Like maybe the first item um, has special actions that the, the other items don't. Um, or maybe you want to add a margin uh, to, the, to all items but the last item. Um, some of these things you could just do with straight CSS, but you might have some reason why you need to do it uh, with JavaScript instead and in your HTML template. Um, so in this case, we can use the uh, ex exported variables that are provided by the Angular team. So in this case, we have all of our examples from before. For that first case, we could use the even or the odd exported variable. Uh, if we need to know the index, there's an exported variable for index directly. Um, and if we know if an item is first or last in the array, there's a variable for that directly as well. Um, so Angular has some great documentation. I think I'm going to look at it real quickly because we're doing a can time, um, which lists all of the variables that they that they export. Um, so you can see like we have things like index, count, first, last, even, odd, um, and these are are all available to you for you to use in the ng4 directly. Uh, we're going to look at an example with index specifically, but I did want to just highlight that index is not the only variable they have. There's, there's a lot of other ones we're not going to, to cover today. Um, but let's look at index. So we, uh, I mentioned before that maybe we have something like a, a delete action and I need to know what index of the item I'm deleting. So in this case, it's really easy. All I add is this index as I. In this case, I can be any variable you want. Um, I'm calling it I just for ease, but I could have called it Michi. I could have called it dog. I could have called it place. You know, anything that you want. This is this is for you to, to use. Uh, the point is that whatever you name this index using the, the as syntax, which should look familiar from the NGF, we can reference that uh, variable elsewhere in our template, um, which we're doing here in delete item. So this case, um, there's a Let's pretend like my to do item, there's a button on it, there's like a trash can where the users can click it. But whenever the user clicks that, this item will emit a delete event. And then the my to do list is responsible for removing that item from the array. So in that case, I would need to know exactly which, which index I want to remove from the array. Um, and then the, the exported index variable uh, covers that use case for me perfectly. Um, so those are exported variables. And again, you can use this with, with multiple variables. You don't have to just use one variable at once. Like I could have index as I, even as E, you know, count as, as C. You can use all of the, the exported variables that you need. So let's move on to data updates, which I've sort of hand waved around how, how data updates work for NG4. For NG, if I talked about it right away, for NG4, I'm, I'm saving it to the end. Um, so the ng4 directive is going to track changes for you automatically. So any changes to your array, it's going to update the DOM. So a change could be something like adding a new object to the array, removing an object from the array, or reordering the objects that you have in the array already. Um, and also specifically having that, uh, because it updates when you remove an object, that's why that delete function that we had before would work, because we would remove that object from the array, the DOM would update, and that item would no longer be visible. So that's pretty cool. It, there's a lot of stuff that it just does for you automatically. But the way it does it is it will use a reference identity for each object in the array. Um, so if you are, we talked about change on push change detection earlier um, in, in math talk. If you're not using on push, this is going to work great for you. If you're, oh, if you're not using an immutable, 
array because you probably have one array. Uh, you're adding or removing elements from that exact same array, which means the DOM's going to update really nicely for you. It's just going to add those um, new HTML elements to your DOM or remove them or reorder them. But if you're using immutable arrays, um, you might be rebuilding um, all of the objects in that array. And so even though all the objects are the same, let's use that to do use case before, I still have the exact same three things to do. I have to walk the dog, go to the gym and write a blog post. When I add a new item that's like, you know, create presentation for, for Angular San Diego, I've recreated those first three items so that their reference identity is no longer the same. The data for it is the exact same, right? The content's the same, but the reference identity isn't. This is going to cause the DOM to flash uh, because it has to rebuild each one of those items, even though, again, they're the exact same. Um, so this is not ideal. Um, this is not a great user experience, right? Because it's kind of ugly for the user. And depending on what your components do that are in your NG4, this can be really expensive, right? If, you, if there's a lot of initialization to rebuild those components, um, that's going to happen for every single one unnecessarily. As with all our other examples, the Angular team has a really great uh, built-in way to avoid this problem. And that's by using the track by function. Uh, the track by function is a, a function that you can bind directly to your ng4 that says, hey, I want to use whatever the output of this function is to track each of the elements in my array. I don't want to use the, the object's reference ID. And then you as a developer have complete control over what uh, that track by function is going to emit. Generally, it's best to return a unique ID that doesn't change when the object's built. So maybe for like the to-do list item example, every time I create a to-do list item, I add an ID to it that's unique. I store that, uh, that ID and the to-do list item itself in my database. And whenever I retrieve the item, I retrieve the ID with it. So the ID is always the same every time I load it. Something like that would be a great thing to use as the, the ID for an object. Um, other things you could use maybe are, are the names, if names are unique. Um, or you could generate an ID based on the values in the object. Um, again, it's really going to be based on your use case. Let's look at an example using ID. Um, in this case, the first thing you do is you create your track by function. In this case, I called it track by FN. Uh, you, the, the API is that the track by function, the first element it takes should be an index. That's going to be the index of the, the item in the ng4. And the second item is going to be whatever that item is. So in my case, it's going to be a to-do item uh, because we're using my to-do list example. And then what this function returns is the ID that we want to use for, for item. In this case, um, to-do item has an ID on it already that, again, I, I'm generating every time we add a to-do item in my example. So I'm just going to return that. Pretty simple. Um, not a lot going on here, just returning the ID. Then in the HTML, I just add a track by function to the ng4. It's right at the end, you just do track by colon and then whatever the name of your function is. And that's all you have to do. Um, those couple lines of code mean that now, whenever I add a new to-do item to my list, um, if it's an immutable, immutable array, it's not going to flash the entire for list. It's not going to, or uh, ng4, it's not going to rebuild each of those uh, components, each of those my to-do items. It's only going to rebuild the ones that it needs to. Um, so this is something that is one of the things I, I sort of recommend that you just add track by functions um, by default if you're using um, if you're using on push or if you're using especially if you're using an immutable uh, data strategy like maybe you have things in the uh, in NGRX store. Um, I just like to think it's best to get in the habit of just always adding a track by function like this because it avoids you having to realize that there's an issue with that data flicker um, and that expensive reload uh, later on when it, when it's in prod. Um, great, so let's summarize. Uh, that's everything we have for NG4. Uh, NG4 is a directive that allows you to iterate over an array of items and then add a new instance of whatever your template is for each item in that array. Um, and again, that, that can be like a template that has you know, a lot of HTML underneath it, or it can just be bound directly to an element, um, like I had in my example, that has a, a, it's a component with its own template. Um, you can make use of local variables that Angular provides to get additional information about where your object is in the array. And you can use the track by function, sorry, um, to get better control over how your DOM rebuilds when there are changes to your array. Um, 
So uh, I have some references before I get into that. Are there any questions for NG4, um, NGIF, structural directives in general? Um, another common one that I'm not covering tonight, uh, just because I didn't want to go over time, is the switch statement, which um, you know NGIF was really similar to the JavaScript if else statement. NG4 is really similar to the the four of um, syntax in JavaScript. The ng switch statement is just like a switch statement in JavaScript. It's just a switch statement in your HTML. Um, all right, cool. Sounds like no questions then. Um, all right, great. Then, um, so I'll share these slides uh, after the after the meetups are over. But I have references here to the um, the structural directive guide um, in Angular, uh, the ng if docs, and the ng four docs. And then, like I mentioned before, I uh, am very lucky that I get to write a blog post for the ng comp team. Um, and so I have two blog posts on ng if and ng four. I'm going to be adding more blog posts for um, for ng switch and then ng templates and ng content um, soonish in the future. So definitely keep an eye out for that. Um, and if you haven't checked out the ng-conf blog, I definitely recommend that you do it. Uh, we have a lot of really great developers uh, writing a lot of really great content um, in those blog posts. Um, so I think there's hopefully something for everyone there. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention that ng-conf enterprise is happening tomorrow and Friday. So the, the keynote is free for everyone. Um, if you don't have a ticket, you I think you can still use the code meetup to get $100 yeah. off your ticket. Does it yes. still work? Okay, yes. cool. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, check it out. Um, you know, it's it's going to be more focused on uh, using Angular and enterprise uh, environments. So really great thing if if you have a company that supports you going to conferences and that you can maybe expense some, um, then this is a great opportunity. Uh, Shares asking if it includes workshops. So they yeah. had workshops this week. Um, yeah. So those are over now. Um, I don't know there if you were, bought. There. Yeah, Sorry, there ahead. were free workshops on Monday, yeah. which I forgot. And <laughs> <Then they had laughs> there's some paid, paid ones. Tuesday and Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you buy, if like you can buy a ticket for the video for the workshop now. It might be too late for that. That's a good question, though. Um, yeah, don't worry, Sherry. I also forgot about oh, Monday. Okay. <laughs> so the free ones were, were recorded, Sherry? On Monday? Yeah, it looks like it because I, I totally okay. forgot about it. And then I got links that, oh, here are links to references. And then I clicked on it and went to a Zoom like recorded. Oh, link. good. Yeah, because I totally forgot about it too. I got the email saying, here's your here's your links for the workshops. And then I'm like yesterday, I'm like, oh, when is that? Isn't that workshop tomorrow? I was thinking it was today. And I looked, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it does expire in seven days though so if you want to watch it right away okay yeah cool. that's good to know yeah. thanks Cher. yep no problem uh, all right cool well that's all i had uh for for my talk on structural directives so thank you everyone uh for for coming today and taking the time to listen to that um if there are no questions we can actually move on to what our uh exciting announcement is for our december meetup I'm sure people must have questions for me. I probably just spoke so fast that it, the information just flew right by. <laughs> um, uh, not Thomas is asking about Switch. Uh, yeah, so there is ng Switch is a another. Um, actually, let me just share it. Um, no, uh, is another uh, structural directive. Um, we have a little bit of time, so I'm gonna show it real quick. And it works again. This is a, the one that looks that works pretty much like a switch statement in JavaScript. Um, you're just going to do star. Uh, you're going to first have ng switch. You have an expression that you know it will have emit like a, a string or something like that. And then you just have ng switch case on whatever elements you want to use that will match your expression. So um, one thing that I do in a couple of places is we like I interchange um, like tables and charts. So I'll be like Display that type ng switch and then ng switch case um, table and then I'll have like a table element and I'll do ng switch case chart then I'll have you know a chart element and then if you want you can use ng switch default um, which will be you know the fall through so again very similar syntax to switch cases in JavaScript uh, which again just makes this really easy to use um, if even if you haven't used a switch statement before um, it's it's pretty easy to get going if you've used a switch statement in JavaScript or Java or 
really any language. And Vivian's asking about advice for all women who want to work with code. Um, so it's like in general, if you just want to get started with software development, uh, my advice for you would be the same for, for anyone, which is um, pick a language or type of work that you're interested in. Um, it's okay if whatever you choose first does not end up being what you use long-term. Uh, the very first language I used was MATLAB. And then I quickly moved to Java and I used Java for a couple of years and then I moved to Angular. That's actually why I love software development so much is you can, you can really have a lot of freedom to, to move around. Um, and, you know, joining something like, um, like Women Who Code, uh, we have like a Slack channel. I think Gemma Jean is on with us tonight. She's our fantastic moderator. She volunteers to, to moderate the Slack channel. Um, surround yourself with a great community of people that can help you when you have questions and cheer you on when you, um, when you're, you know, stuck on problems. Um, I think, you know, the hardest thing about being a, a woman in tech is you often aren't going to work with a lot of other women. So finding that community around you that can, um, that can be there to support you is a, is a really great thing. Um, that's, that's why I joined Women Who Code originally. That's, that's why I ended up becoming um, a co-director is just because I like the community that, that we built. Um, and I think it, it helps um, really all the time. And they're just awesome. That was a vague answer. So hopefully that answered your question sort of. Um, but yeah, I just like find, find a language you want, find like a tutorial, like maybe something on like Pluralsight um, or um, Thinkster. Uh, there's a lot of great free tutorials online. You can kind of just like tinker, see what you want. Um, and then, you know, you can try to get involved with open source. Uh, our friends at Open Source San Diego, we're looking for Angular developers specifically. Um, so you could check them out. Um, they have a, a GitHub, they also have a Slack and like a, a website, open source, I think it's open source San Diego dot org. Um, I think if you Google it though, you can find it. No, yeah, good, Robert's here. <laughs> um, thank you, Robert. Um, so yeah, like joining a, a community like that can really be helpful to build out your skills. You have some people to work with. Even if you're just starting working with documentation that helps you learn the code base and you can start writing code. Um, cool. Um, all right. Any other questions? Uh, okay. Um, so I'm not sure what your question is. Uh, I'm gonna announce the our December meetup, and then we'll, I, we'll we should have time to open the floor. Um, so Julie and I. Um, have an exciting announcement for everyone. For December, uh, instead of doing, oh, sorry, one second. So I was asking what company is looking for web application development. I was referencing uh, Open San Diego, which uh, Robert is also in this meetup. He's one of the um, contributors for Open San Diego. And they're just a, um, uh, it's volunteer. Uh, they do local San Diego um, software development to help out the community. Um, yeah, Robert, if you could drop a link to that, that would be really great because um, they're, Definitely a really cool group to, to work with if you're looking for some, some side projects. Um, okay, December meetup announcement. Um, so on December 16th, or the third Wednesday, the regular day that we do a meetup, instead of doing a talk-based meetup or doing our general December tradition, which is going to happy hour at somewhere like Ballast Point, which we can't do, we are instead going to do um, a new event called Angular Arena. Um, so what is Angular Arena? Um, this is going to be the first annual um, Battle of the Meetups. We are pairing with Angular Utah and Angular Portland to put on a trivia competition um, with all three of our meetups. So we're going to get, uh, we're going to use, I think, Remo as our platform, um, which is this like cool platform that has like different tables. You can have a team of people or you can do it individually, whichever you prefer. And um, we'll use Kahoot as our, our trivia platform. So like at the beginning, there'll be, you know, however many people join, um, we'll have one round of trivia, the top, you know, n number of people are going to move on to the next round of trivia until we get to the top three people. Um, so it's a, it's gonna be a fun, lighthearted, but uh, competition. Um, and then we'll see if uh, in the end, is it someone from San Diego, Portland, or, or Utah that's at the top. 
Um, there's gonna be prizes for the people that win the top uh, three prizes. We're also gonna give away some prizes just throughout the event. Um, so even if you um, are just learning Angular and you're worried that you might not be able to be one of those top three, that's okay. Please join us anyway. Uh, you might be able to get a fun prize throughout the night. Um, Joe Eames is going to be one of the MCs. Uh, we might have some other MCs as well. Joe Eames, if, you, if you're not familiar with him, is the CEO of Thinkster. Um, he's pretty involved in, in ng-conf as well. Um, so we're really excited to have him. Um, and Julie, did I miss anything? I don't think so. Okay. But it's going to be exciting. Uh, we don't have the meetup posted yet, but keep, yes, I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't have a post yet, but definitely keep an eye out. Um, build a team. Like we want to get as many people from San Diego um, joining the event as possible. Um, so you know, hopefully we'll have someone from San Diego that's that's going to end up on top at the end. Um, but yeah, so we're really excited about it. Um, if this works out, we're hoping we can do it um, again uh, sometime in the future. But this is going to be the first first event. Um, so yeah, so that's all I have. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, what's better than awesome? I don't know. Angular Arena is better than awesome. <laughs> um, so cool. So that's that's all we have tonight. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>